stay in your foxhole. Stay in your foxhole. Now, just so everybody's on the same page, what in the world is a foxhole? Well, let me tell you what it is. Your commander, your sergeant, your lieutenant, your captain, whoever it might be, your corporal, somebody higher than you, gives you an order. Hey, soldier, I want you to dig a hole. The deeper the better for your protection. But I want you to dig a hole right there. And I want you to guard this area and don't leave unless ordered. Stay there. Stay in your foxhole. Christians, why in the world would a soldier leave a foxhole? Why? Coward? Afraid? Can I show you this morning, people, your foxhole? There it is. There's your foxhole, lady. There's your foxhole, sir. Stay in it. For our message this morning, if you'll allow me, could I take you to the book of Philippians? The book of Philippians. What a great little book this is of four chapters. And the book of Philippians, as you're turning there, before I tell you what chapter and verse, can I just refresh your memories as to why Philippians is in our Bible? I think you'll find this interesting. Remember, Paul took three missionary journeys and a trip to Rome. Paul's on his second missionary journey, and he's in a city called Troas. The word Troas, people, just simply means Troy. You could call it Troy and be correct. He's in Troas. How often Paul went to Troas, we have no idea. But evidently, there was a great church there that really loved Paul. And he spent a lot of time there. And so there he is in Troas. And one night he has a vision. And folks, we don't have visions anymore because we don't need them. We've got the complete word of God. But he had a vision. And in that vision, there's a man who's saying, Paul, please come to Macedonia. Folks, what is so wonderful about that is that Macedonia is Greece. It's Greek. For the first time, God is calling his message to the Gentiles. It's always been a Middle East issue up until that point. And for the first time, God is saying, please go to the Gentile nations. And so he went across that a little body of water to Macedonia. Macedonia is a country. Uh, you might find this interesting. Had he been, he went in a northwesterly direction because of the trade winds that would have taken him one day by boat. If he'd have been going the other way, it would have taken him three. So within one day, he had obeyed that vision. He hit the shores of Macedonia, and he made a beeline, people, to a very significant city. That city was called Philippi. It was called Philippi because a good 100, 200 years before, it had been founded as a military outpost and named after Alexander the Great's daddy, Philip. And it was, so it began as a military outpost, and it was a rough place, as, as often military outposts can be. It was rough, but it grew and got very wealthy and it was, became a became a very significant city. So Paul goes to Philippi. He gets there and his normal custom was to make a beeline for the synagogue, but there was no synagogue in Philippi. But he did hear about a group of devout Jewish women who met down by the river for some kind of fellowship, some kind of prayer. And Paul, can you imagine Paul showed up at a ladies Bible study? There's a document people that has survived from the second century that described what Paul looked like. Whether or not this document is accurate, we have no idea. But the document says that he was short. He was bald. All godly men are. He was short. <laughs> he was bald. He had a very large nose. He had cuts all over his face. He was bow-legged. And can you imagine, people, a man looking like that showing up at a ladies' Bible study? Hi, ladies. Can I take it today? And evidently, they said yes, because he took it. And friends, he preached the gospel, and many of them got saved one of which was a woman by the name of Lydia, who was evidently a successful businesswoman because the Bible tells us later that the church that got planted at Philippi met at her house. So evidently she was a woman of means, but uh, she was a dyer of purple and only royalty. Rich people wore purple. And so Lydia, among others, got saved. And folks, a church got started in Philippi, just like yours. A church got started and men got saved. Because Philippians is written to the bishops and deacons at the church of Philippi. So men got saved. But it all got started because of godly women. Isn't that interesting? And so this church, and let me tell you about this church, people. Over and over again in the Bible, you read that they loved Paul. They sent him money over and over again. They absolutely adored Paul. He was their church father. He led many of them to the Lord. They loved him. Absolutely loved him. About 14, 15 years later, word got back to this church of Philippi that their beloved Paul was now a prisoner of Nero. I don't know how much you know about history, but if you were a prisoner of Nero, it did not bode well for you. The guy was literally a nutcase. Well, they were worried. The church at Philippi was worried. They were worried about two things. 
they were worried, number one, what's going to happen to our Paul? We love that man. We adore him. He's our church father. We absolutely adore him. What in the world is going to happen to Paul? He's the number one spokesman for the gospel in the Gentile world. What in the world is going to happen to Paul? And they worried, secondly, about what's going to happen to the gospel. You see, people, it was brand new, perceived by most to be a cult, referred to derogatorily as the way. They were so narrow-minded. They believed there was only one way to get to heaven. And so they were referred to as the way, kind of a cult. And they were worried, was the church at Philippi, what? is going to happen to the gospel. The number one spokesman in the Gentile world is now in prison. Well, people, evidently, one Sunday morning, shortly after getting that news, the pastor of the church stood up and said, could I please get a volunteer? Would somebody be willing to walk the 700 plus miles from Philippi to Rome, check on Paul, take him some money, and minister to his needs for a while? Folks, they had a volunteer. What a man. And he's got one of the coolest names in the Bible. His name was Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus. Would you say that out loud, please? Go ahead and say it. It's fun to say. What a name. Isn't that a cool name? I'm asking the Lord that before he takes me home, I would like to meet an Epaphroditus. I've never met one. I would like to just put out a plea. Those of you of marriageable age and childbearing age, would you pray about naming your next son Epaphroditus? We could call him Epi. We could call him Guy. We could call him Tuss. What, you know, whatever you like. But what a cool name. Now, let me tell you, folks. Let me be honest with you. There's a young couple in Pennsylvania. I was doing a revival there about six months, six to nine months ago. And a young couple, and she, she was kind of large, expecting a son. And they told me, the, the, the dad told me, Brother Mike, all right, we're going to name our son Epaphroditus, but it's going to be his middle name. <laughs> Not good enough. I want a first name Epaphroditus. Would you pray about it? Just pray about it. I would love to meet an Epaphroditus. Cool name. But anyway, his name was Epaphroditus. He said, I'll go. I'll go. And he did. And friends, let me tell you what happened. Epaphroditus, we're not sure how he did it, but he got there seven to 800 miles away. He got there. And when he got there, let me tell you what he found. Paul was not in prison. Oh, he was a prisoner. But we're told that the Roman Roman government would often let unique special privileges to a, a special prisoner like Paul, where they could rent a house and be under house arrest. He was under house arrest. Now, what that meant, people, if you were under house arrest, you were chained to a Praetorian guard 24-7, nothing personal, nothing private. They heard everything. They saw everything. He was chained to a Praetorian guard, and that's what Epaphroditus found. We don't know how long Epaphroditus is there, but he left, no doubt, carrying with us the book of Philippians. And friends, let me tell you what Paul does. In the book of Philippians, the first thing he does in chapter one is he hits their two worries. And let me just summarize what he says about their two worries. He says, first of all, don't worry about me. I am right in the middle of God's will. Don't worry about me. I'm right where God wants me. Ladies and gentlemen, that flew in the face of Paul's critics. There were all kinds of critics going around saying, Paul's in prison because of God's judgment of what he has said about Judaism. Paul's in prison because of what he has said about the law. God's got Paul in prison to shut his mouth. And Paul says, oh no, no. I'm right in the middle of God's will. I'm right where he wants me. So don't worry about it. Please pray for my release because I'd like to see you again. But I'm right in the middle of God's will. And I love that verse 12 where it says, For whatsoever things happen to heaven, rather under the furtherance of the gospel. I am right where God wants me. What an answer. Then he says about your second worry about the gospel. <laughs> Let me tell you about the gospel. He tells you in chapter 1, there's a revival going on in the Roman government. Now chew on that, Christians. There's a revival going on. In an ungodly, satanic government called the Roman government, there's a revival. How in the world did that happen? In fact, people, tradition says that Nero's wife was a Christian. How did that happen? Well, let's go back to Paul, shall we? He's chained to a Praetorian guard. Let me tell you about a Praetorian guard. They were to the Roman army what our United States Navy SEALs or our Green Berets are to our army. These guys were specially chosen, specially trained, very, very sharp men. Historians tell us they would serve anywhere from 15 to 20 years. Their number one responsibility was to protect the Caesar, whoever he was. These guys were sharp. And when they were chained to a soldier, when they were chained to a prisoner like the Apostle Paul, they would be chained with about an 18-inch chain in six-hour increments 
which people, that means four different Praetorian guards would have been chained to Paul every day. They saw everything. They heard everything. And these guys were sharp. They would have seen Paul do miracles. The Bible tells us that Paul did do miracles in Rome. He would, they would have seen people get saved. People did get saved because the apostle Paul in Rome, you know about one of them. His name was Onesimus. He was a slave. You read about him in Philemon. Onesimus got saved in Rome with the, by the apostle Paul. So people, and folks, these Praetorian guards, they were sharp guys. And they saw everything. They heard everything. They saw every reaction. They heard every word. And no doubt many of them got saved. I hope you'll enjoy the humor of the next statement. People, it's one thing to be chained to a Praetorian guard. It's an entirely different dynamic to be chained to Paul. Who's really chained to who? He had captive audiences. And no doubt many of them got saved. And he tells you in chapter 1, there's a revival going on in the Roman government. Could I just pause there for a second? May I just remind all of you, if you know the Lord, you're chained too. You're chained to a job. You're chained to an area. You're chained to a church. You're chained to a marriage. You're chained to parents. And God's got you right where he wants you. I hope that because people are being chained to you, people are getting saved. I wonder if you were in the apostle, if you had an 18-inch chain on you and there was somebody chained to you, would they get saved because they saw every reaction you had? They saw your lifestyle. They saw what you were like. May that be something to kind of contemplate and think about in your mind. I sure hope so. But many of them got saved. And put, so Paul says, don't worry about the gospel. Church of Brooklyn, don't worry about the gospel. It is still as powerful as it's ever been. We just need to be faithful with it. You don't have to marry it to rock and roll. You don't have to marry it to a celebrity. It does fine all by itself. Just keep giving out those tracks. Keep having those street parties, those block parties. Just give out the gospel. And it is God's power to salvation. Can I get an amen? amen. It's, it's, it's very, very powerful. So Paul says, don't you worry about the gospel. And then, friends, having covered all that, Paul then shares our text this morning. It's found in verse 27 of chapter 1. Would you turn there with me, please? Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27. And would you do me a favor, church? If you've got a King James Bible here this morning, and I understand most of you do. If you've got a King James Bible here this morning, I'd like you to do something for me. When I count to three, would you please give me the first word of verse 27? Let me tell you why. It's a biggie. It's a biggie. The very first word of 27. Are you ready? One, two, three. Only. Very good. Only. Now, let me tell you what's going on there. The word only, people, your word only, kind of has it the same idea that you ladies do when you're trying to get your husband's attention and he's watching the Yankees. What do you do? You go, hey, look at me. I got something important to tell you. Look at me. Kind of what you parents do when your teenagers playing a video game and you got something important to tell him or her. What do you do? Hey, look at me. Pause it. Focus right here. I got something important to tell you. Ladies and gentlemen of Jesus Christ, that is exactly what Paul is doing to you. He's saying, hey, Christian, it's good to know about my biography. It's good to know about the power of the gospel. But I really want you to catch this. Oh, it's good to know that other stuff. Yeah, it's under inspiration. Good to know that. But I really want you to catch this. And what does he really want you to catch, church? Let's read on. Could we go back to verse 27 and catch this, would you? Look what Paul says. He says, only let your conversation what a word be as it becometh the gospel of christ would you look at me please only let your conversation now paul saying can i get this this is really big time important new york christian may your conversation be as it becometh. now folks you've got to know that when paul used that word conversation it rang their philippian bells uh, you could just see him all of a sudden whoa we know that word Folks, the word conversation in the original language comes from the same word that we get our word, politics. Politics. When you and I sit down and we talk about politics, what are we doing? They say never do that at the Thanksgiving table. Never talk about religion and politics. And that, and what, what cowards. But when you, and I, when you and I talk about politics, what are we really doing? We're talking about our opinions, our thoughts what we think of, of our leaders, our taxes, the, the way things are being governed. We're talking, folks, when we talk about politics, we're talking about the way that you and I conduct ourselves as citizens, as citizens. Let me tell you why that word would have rang their Philippian bells, and Paul's going to use it again here in just a few, a few, uh, few verses, and I'll show it to you in a moment. 
But when he said that word, you got to know that those Philippians sat up in their chairs because let me tell you why. Let me share with you something I haven't shared yet about Philippi. Philippi, there were only a couple hundred cities like Philippi in the Roman Empire. There were hundreds of thousands of cities, but there were only about 200 that were like Philippi. Philippi was what was called a Roman colony. A Roman colony. Say that out loud. Would you please, congregation? A Roman colony. Remember that because that's really significant. Now, when I say colony, I know what's going on. I'm looking at Americans. And when I say the word colony, you immediately think of 13 stripes in our flag. You think log cabins. You think rustic, shoe buckles, muskets, deers, turkeys, Indians, yeah, yeah, yeah. homeschool. You think that when I say colony. And friends, that's not being fair to the word. May I remind you, Americans, that the first 100 to 150 years of our country, we were very loyal. We were very loyal to England, to the crown, to the king, to the queen. You wouldn't talk evil about them. We were very, very loyal. And when you came to America, you thought you were coming to a piece of England away from England. That's why I'm preaching to you this morning in English and not Spanish. English was the official language of England. <laughs> Duh, England. And we were very loyal to England. We loved England. They were, they were our protectors. And, and we lovingly paid our taxes until 1776. We were very loyal. So when you came to America, you were coming, hear me carefully, to a piece of England away from England, including New York. Amen? New York. We were very loyal. Friends, the word citizenship was so significant to a Philippian. Because they were a piece of Rome away from Rome. Oh, you got to know. Hey, stay with me now. You got to know. They were very, very proud of that identification. If you were born in Philippi, you were automatically a Roman citizen. Oh, people, to be a Roman citizen, first of all, you were a minority. And if you were a Roman citizen, there were laws you didn't have to obey. There were taxes you didn't have to pay. There were tolls you didn't have. You were, hear me carefully, you were privileged. Privileged. Say that out word, that word out loud. Would you please, congregation, say it. Privileged. Say it like I would. Privileged. There you go. Good. Got your way. Privileged. You were privileged. Folks, those, when, when they, they and you got to know, they were so proud. Philippians were so proud of that identity. We're Romans. And they were so proud of it. Let me tell you what historians tell us. You women. Of Philippi stayed up on the latest fashion of Rome and wore your hair accordingly. Mm -hmm. You men, you didn't have long hair. That was considered barbarian. You had short hair because every good Roman citizen would have short hair, a man. You ladies stayed up on the latest fashion of Rome and wore it there in Philippi. In fact, gentlemen, when you conducted business in Philippi, you didn't speak the guttural Greek like the rest of Macedonia. You spoke the official language of Rome. Latin and you are proud of it. Well, friends, could I show you something, Christians? Would you hold your finger here and turn one page in your Bible to chapter three and verse 20? And watch this. Let's drive this home. What's the, what's the point, Mike? Watch this. Chapter three. Ch everybody turn there. I'm going to preach until three o'clock. Okay. <laughs> chapter three and verse number 20. All right. I want you to say it out loud when we get to it. You ready? Here we go. Verse number 20, chapter three. Are you with me? Say amen. If your Bible's open, you're awake. All right, three of you. Here we go. Chapter 20, chapter 3, verse 20. The Bible says, For our what church? Conversation is in where church? Heaven. Oh, people. You, if you know the Lord, you are so privileged. When you you're a you're you're <laughs> do you know what it's like, by the way, church? Do you know what it's like to be privileged? Have you ever enjoyed being privileged? Can I give you a very, very self-serving mundane illustration? I'm an evangelist. I don't travel with a fifth wheel. I fly everywhere. And because of that, I always fly Delta Airlines because I can take three suitcases free. I save a lot of money that way. And I fly Delta Airlines so much that I am, and I want to say, ooh, I am a platinum member of their mileage club. Thank you. Thank you. Let me tell you why it's an ooh. Very often when I fly, and I'm going to be flying this afternoon, and I've already, this has already happened. I'll tell you what's already happened. When I will be at the gate, or sometimes I'll get an email, and I'll be at the gate, and I'll hear my name with a loudspeaker. Would Mike Schrock please come to the desk? I sure will. 
<laughs> I know what's about to happen. I get up there. They ask me for my ticket. They rip it up. They then slide a new ticket across the counter. I am being upgraded to first class. Well, thank you. It isn't. It, it isn't. It, I don't know if you've ever flown first class, but let me tell you what happens when you fly first class. <laughs> you get to get on the airplane first. Ooh, let me tell you why that's an ooh. When you get on the airplane first, you have first dibs at all the overhead compartment space. I travel heavy. I've got a trumpet case in one hand, a briefcase full of hair products in another hand. And I get first dibs at all that. Over and then old people, come here, come here, come here. It gets better. I then sit in the front of the airplane instead of the back where I used to be. I'm up front where they have sofa chairs. And I sit down and I sink down in my seat. I sink in the cushions. And if it's a good flight crew, immediately there's a flight attendant in my face. Mr. Schrock, they always know your name in first class. Mr. Schrock, what would you like to drink? Well, I think this morning I'd like to have some apple juice on the rocks, please. <laughs> they run to their little kitchenette. They pour me an apple juice. They hand it to me. And there I sit in all my plush cushions while all these poor peons walk by me going back to their sardine seats. <laughs> I am not suggesting for a minute, people, that I am better than anybody in this room, but it's kind of fun. It's, it's kind of fun to have that privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, can you imagine, would you try to, a whole lifetime like that? That's what it meant to be a Roman citizen. You were privileged. And would you catch this? Come on, let's catch this. You just read in chapter 3, verse 20, that you've got something far better than first class in Delta. You've got reservations in heaven. Woo we win. We win. Oh, that's far better. Far better. You have so much privilege. In fact, let me tell you about one of your privileges. When you people pray, if you know the Lord, when you pray, no matter what the request, no matter how <laughs> minimal it might be, how insignificant it might be in other people's lives, when you pray it, God hears it. He hears your prayer. He doesn't the unsaved. He does you. You're so privileged, and every one of you that know the Lord, you've got reservations in heaven. You're there. Could I get an amen? You're there. Amen. Do we ever have a good or what? Folks, and let me tell you about heaven. Amen. It's beyond my imagination and yours to just absolutely visualize how wonderful it is. It is going to be, wahoo! Yeah, baby. This is wonderful. <laughs> wow, we got it good. Now, having said that, friends, go back to chapter 1, verse 27, would you please? You're privileged. So when Paul used that word conversation, it rang their Philippian bells. You know why? But look what he says. Because with that privilege, people, comes responsibility. Watch this. Only, now catch this, believer, Paul's saying. Catch this. This is important. Focus here. Come on now. Only let your conversation, your lifestyle, be as it, next word out loud, church, become it. Become it. What does that word mean? What does it mean to be becoming? Let me illustrate. My um, my wife and I will have been married this coming July for 42 years. In those 42 years, and it's all because of her, trust me. But in those 42 years, she's learned a thing or two about me. Some of it good, some of it not so good. But one of the good things, at least in her estimation, one of the good things that she likes about me, there are many things. She thinks I'm pretty awesome. <laughs> one of the good things that she likes about me is the fact that she thinks maybe you would disagree and that's okay i really don't care what you think i care what she does amen but uh, she thinks she thinks that i'm pretty good with color with color now i'm not one of these but i like color i i, I find men's clothing sometimes to be so boring i like color I like you know I, I like color and she thinks i'm pretty good at it and so she comes to me all the time, people, and you leave her alone because I like it, okay? She comes to me all the time and she'll say this, Michael, and I love it when she calls me that. It's a, it's a term of endearment. Michael, do you think that these earrings go with this top? Michael, do you think this necklace goes with this outfit? Michael, would you wear blue shoes or red shoes with this outfit? Michael, do you think that this blouse goes with this? She's asking me stuff like that all the time. And I like it. She's asking my opinion. You know why? She's about, hear me carefully, church. She's about to go out in public. And she wants to look right. She wants to be becoming. She's about to, she taught, she taught nursing at Bob's University for 12 years. She stood in front of large classes. She wanted to look right. She was about to go out in public. She wants to look right. She wants to be becoming. 
Ladies and gentlemen, are you catching this? Paul saying, Christian, I'm glad you know about my biography. I'm glad you know about the power of the gospel. But do you look right? That's really the important thing. Do you look like somebody whose sin has been forgiven? Do you live like somebody whose sin has been forgiven? Do you look like a Christian? Do you look Christ-like? Paul saying, hey, Christian, catch this. Really big time important. Do you look right? There's no doubt in my mind in a church this size, many of you, by your lifestyle, are hurting our cause. I want to tell you about one. I was doing a revival a number of years ago in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yes, there are Christians there. I know that shocks you. But um, I was doing a revival. And the pastor of the church on Tuesday took me out to lunch. It was January. January, the Tuesday, for lunch. We went to one of those restaurants. He, he chose. He took me to one of those restaurants that probably all of you are familiar with, where there were flat screen TVs all over the walls. It's one of those restaurants you'd love to go to during college football season. You can watch a bunch of games at the same time. It was one of those restaurants. But it was Tuesday. There were no games on. But our maitre d' took us to a table. She sat us down. And I was literally from, from that, that edifice right there, from, away from a huge 90-inch flat screen TV. And they were showing music videos. They had the sound turned off, fortunately. But the images were still there. We'd been sitting there for about five minutes when all of a sudden a young lady came on that screen. If I were to say her name this morning, all of you would recognize it. She's very famous and she's very attractive. But she came on that screen and she started moving in a way that was commanded by her music. Some of you Christian crybabies need to grow up and realize that music always has a message, even without words. And she was moving in a way that was commanded by her music. Folks, as a Christian man, I had to turn in my booth so that I wouldn't see it out in my peripheral vision. And I share that with you because I know something about that girl. I would be glad to tell you her name. If you want to see me after the service, that would be fine. But I know something about her. I have read over and over and over, over the years in the media, she claims to be a Christian. Here she is on my screen, moving in a very sexual way, wearing an outfit that said, and I'm about to sell ice to Eskimos. You Americans know exactly what I'm talking about. But she was wearing an outfit that just said, I'm ready to party. I'm ready to get it on. And, and, and she claims to be a, a Christian. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm going to take her for her word because she's said it over and over again over the, over the years. She claims to be a Christian. Huh. Uh, uh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait, wait. My Bible says, Mike, flee fornication. Run from it. You can't handle it. Get out of here. Run. But yet there's my Christian sister saying, no, Mike, don't flee. Don't run. Chase it. Let me help you. Folks, I don't mean to be overly mean, but she is what Proverbs calls a diamond in a pig snout. Her beauty is a diamond. Her testimony is piggish. What's the people? What's the opposite of becoming? Talk to me. What's the opposite of becoming? Unbecoming or ugly. Can I suggest to you that even though she's going to spend eternity with me in heaven, God's going to hold her accountable for looking so ugly. She's unbecoming. She's the opposite. She has become what Paul is saying. No, no. And some of you might be going in that same direction in your heart of hearts. Oh, I want to look like the world. Oh, I love their music. And I, I love their fashion. And I love their entertainment. And I'm, I'm, I'm not. Ooh, you're weird. You're so not what Jesus Christ intended. No, you don't look right. And Paul is saying, hey, Christians, catch this. The most important thing about your Christianity is you looking right. Does a Christian drink that? Does a Christian listen to that? Does a Christian watch that? Does a Christian talk like that? Does a Christian have those kinds of thoughts? That ought to be a consuming presence, my friend, in your life if you're going to be attractive. And if you're really saved, way down deep in your heart of hearts, you're going, you're right. I should look Christ-like. I should be becoming to the gospel. Wow. Let's read on. Could we please? Verse 27. Are you with me? Verse 27. Only, catch this now, let your, con let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, in other words, people, it doesn't matter if your pastor's watching, I may hear, oh, would you look at me, please? Are you aware of the fat Christians that we hear about you? Every one of you that claim to be saved, you've got a reputation. 
and you should welcome that. I hear crybaby Christians sometimes say, well, people should judge me. I should, blah, 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 blah. oh, shut up, grow up. You should welcome the fact that people are watching you. It gives you a chance to be salt. It gives you a chance to be light. There ought to be something different about you. You should welcome their stares. You should welcome their gaze. You should welcome their studying your life. You ought to make them thirsty. Could I get an amen? Sure is quiet in here. Sure is quiet. You've got a reputation, ladies. Even a child, the Bible says, even a child is known by his ways, whether he be evil or whether he be good. Every one of you got a reputation. And Paul is saying, hey, I sure hope I hear about you, lady. I sure hope I hear about you, teenager. I sure hope I hear about you, sir. Ha, ah, you're becoming. You're a good testimony. You're doing well. I hope you got a good reputation. But look, what, what, what kind of reputation did Paul want you to have? Well, let's read on, could we? Read on. I stopped there in the middle of a phrase where he says, where am I? Verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ, that whether I, whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs or your lifestyle, that ye next two words out loud, church, say it. Stand fast. Bethel, Baptist Fellowship, should have a reputation of standing fast. Every one of you saints, young people, old people in between, every one of you should have a reputation. You stand fast. I mean, you really stand fast, girl. You really fast stand fast, guy. Every one of you should have that kind of reputation. What does it mean? What does it mean to stand fast? Well, let me help you. Could I please? The best definition, the, by the way, people, the phrase stand fast is military. It's a military origin. And what it means, the best definition I've ever heard is this. Stay in your foxhole. Stay in your foxhole. Now, just so everybody's on the same page, what in the world is a foxhole? Well, let me tell you what it is. Your commander, your sergeant, your lieutenant, your captain, whoever it might be, your corporal, somebody higher than you, gives you an order. Hey. Soldier, I want you to dig a hole. The deeper, the better for your protection. But I want you to dig a hole right there. And I want you to guard this area and don't leave unless ordered. Stay there. Stay in your foxhole. Christians, why in the world would a soldier leave a foxhole? Why? Coward. Afraid. Can I show you to this morning, people, your foxhole? There it is. There's your foxhole, lady. There's your foxhole, sir. Stay in it. What does it say about your life? What does it say? Oh, I'm about to use a word that always gets me in trouble. It's a five-letter word. I do a lot of preaching to teenagers. I like that because they're easy to read. Old people like you are kind of hard to read because you're wrinkly and saggy. But young people are, are kind of, and, and, uh, and I, it's funny. I'll be I'll preaching at a camp, and I'll use this five-letter word, and I'll see their countenance go, ah, shut up, Baldy. <laughs> but that five-letter word, people, is so directional. And it is so crucial and will tell me everything I need about your spiritual status. That five-letter word, music. Music. You let me hear your music. Billy Sunday himself would say in your church, let me hear your congregational singing and I'll tell you how hot your church is. I'd like to take that a step further. Let me hear what you listen to in your privacy and I'll tell you what kind of Christian you really are. Music's so powerful. And are you aware, according to Dr. Frank Garlock, who's with the Lord now, a personal friend of mine used to say, there are over 600 references in this foxhole about your music. But we, oh, music's so personal. Hey, you, Lord, I'm so glad I'm going to heaven. And hey, I'm so glad you saved me. Thank you for dying for my music. That's my deal. Back off. Ooh, you're ugly. You're not what the Lord wants. Every air of your life, Christian, ought to be based on the foxhole. Every area, the way you dress, the way you talk, what you drink, how you act towards your wife, your husband, towards the opposite sex, how you are with your employer, everything about your life, Christian, is based or should be on that foxhole. And the Bible says if it is, ooh, you're good looking. You're becoming. You stand fast. You don't move. I will close with this example, but don't get excited because it's going to take me a half hour. <laughs> I don't know if you have heard this name before. She was on Fox News two summers ago. There's a young lady I want to tell you about. Her name is Jaylene. It used to be Hinkle. She got married. It's now Wilson. Jaylene Wilson. Have you ever heard of her? Perhaps you have. Let me tell you about her. I have permission from my wife 
that if I ever meet her in person, I'm going to give her a big hug. I'm going to slip her a 20 and have her have a Starbucks on me. She's one of my heroes. Let me tell you about her. She's a young lady. She's a young mother now. But she went to a Christian school in Denver, Colorado, to a Christian school that was kind of notorious for a good soccer program. She was good. But way down deep in her heart, Jaylene always had a personal goal. I would love to play on the United States women's national team. Oh, people, they're really good. I don't know if you watch them. I like watching them. They always win the gold medal. They're always the favorite to win the World Cup <laughs> in the women's division. They're really good. Jaylene was a phenomenal soccer player in high school. She got a scholarship to go to the University of North Carolina to play soccer, and she did. When she was at the University of North Carolina, she got selected by the United States women's national team to play for them, and she immediately started. She's a phenomenal midfielder. She was playing, and the, some of you might remember this, and I haven't said this yet. Hear me carefully. Jaylene loves the Lord. She's a Christian. She's outspoken about her faith. You can go to her website. I would challenge you. Not right now, please. <laughs> but she loves the Lord. And don't you know that the women's national team came along and said, hey, we want to promote the homosexual left lifestyle. We're going to put the rainbow on our uniforms. Jaylene went to her coaches and she said, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm against that lifestyle because the Bible's against that lifestyle. Could I please be excused from wearing that rainbow? I can't wear it. Her coaches said, no, you must wear it. Jaylene got kicked off the team. Gave up a lifelong dream for the sake of the gospel. She was standing fast. Now, her, her story continues. Let me continue. She then got chosen to play for the North Carolina professional team. I am a soccer referee, professional soccer referee in Greenville, South Carolina, where we have a professional team. I run the clock. And the University of North Carolina, their team is called the Courage, unfittingly. And the North Carolina Courage came to play Greenville. Jaylene wasn't there that night, and I'll tell you why. Jaylene started playing for the Courage. She's really good people. But don't you know that the Courage decided they were going to have a night where they were going to promote the rainbow and its cause. Jaylene went to her coaches and she said, I'm a Christian. I can't do that. Her coaches said, that's okay, Jaylene. You don't have to. So she didn't. She played the game with no rainbow. Fans saw it. And they wrote letters and they called in. You know how aggressive that whole movement can be. They got on, they got on her case. They got on this cause. And finally, the team had to let Jaylene go under fan pressure. Folks, I want you to understand something. Jaylene in God's eyes, is gorgeous. I wonder if you'd be willing to give up a life dream for the sake of the gospel, the sake of your conviction, because you stand fast. You stay in your foxhole. I don't care what's politically correct. I don't care what all my friends are doing. As for me and my house, we will serve the foxhole. I'm all about the foxhole. Folks, I'm wondering here this morning, how many of you are good looking? I'm not talking about physically. That's very, very temporal. I'm talking about the way you live. Are you staying in the foxhole? If somebody were chained to you, would they fall in love with this book? Boy, I sure hope so. If not, you need to get right. You're not what the Lord wants. You need to get right. 